For the second part of the lecture here, we're going to pivot to talk about where I think the community detection tools in R need to go for wider use. Uh, in particular, we're going to endeavor to concisely cover the three topics in the second half of our outline here so that you can be looking for these and other similar improvements uh, inside, the, inside of the R environment in the future. But first, I, I want to take a step back and, and set the stage and have a little perspective on, on where we are at this point um, to provide context for what we're going to talk about in, in this second half of the lecture. First, we need to acknowledge that modularity is problematic. It's a descriptive measure, but it wasn't developed to be statistically principled in any generative sense and only finds assorted structures, and it's biased towards balanced communities. That said, it remains, I think it's safe to say, the most used method of community detection in practical applications, because there are many fast heuristics that are easily accessible across multiple different computational environments, including in R. Uh, that said, it's also frequently misused because these fast heuristics introduce pseudo randomness in quickly finding good solutions to an NP hard problem. And because they typically don't make it clear or provide much guidance about picking the resolution and coupling parameters. So for instance, this is why I uh, talked at some length in the first part of the lecture about what I think is, is actually a really nice nudge that Vincent Trog is providing to the users by, uh, by, by not setting a reasonable default resolution parameter for the constants POTS model default inside of the cluster Leiden package. It really is forcing the user as much as he can to change uh, that parameter. Um, indeed, in some common computational environments, it's relatively difficult or, or outright impossible for users to modify the resolution parameter as we've seen and they don't even know they're misusing it. So our philosophy is that if you're gonna use uh, multi, if you're gonna use modularity or it's multi-layer extension, then we wanna help you to use it right. And so the first of the tools that we're gonna talk about here um, is the identification of what we call the convex hull of admissible modularity partitions or CHAMP. And we did cover this uh, at some greater length in the 2019 lectures. And I just need a, a piece of uh, champ for where we're gonna go here in the this second part of the lecture. So as uh, uh, if you want a more complete discussion about it, you might wanna see those 2019 lectures. Um, the key ideas here that I want to uh, present, which were developed by uh, graduate student uh, William Ware, along with some undergraduate researchers in my group, Scott Emmons and Ryan Gibson, and also Dane Taylor when he was a postdoc in my group, is that CHAMP selects out the partitions that are dominant relative to a set somewhere in the parameter space. So this cartoon uh, represents the CHAMP workflow. Basically, you start with the points here representing partitions of nodes into communities computed by a computational heuristic. It doesn't matter what heuristic you used to compute them, or really even if you just assigned some of these partitions by hand. Here, um, the points are representing different values in a 2D parameter space that, um, that might represent the gathering of those partitions. A, a natural context here, given what we've been talking about with multi-layer modularity, is this might be the 2D space of a interlayer coupling parameter and an intralayer resolution parameter. Champ takes these partitions as input and outputs a smaller set of partitions that uh, we call the admissible subset or the champ set of somewhere optimal partitions along with their domains of optimality in the parameter space. So not every one of these points is going to be somewhere optimal, but every point of the space has one of these partitions is the one that did best at that point in the space. And it's not necessarily a uh, partition that was actually computed at that uh, parameter value. Um, to see how CHAMP works, let's go back to that 2000, uh, fall 2000 college football Div 1A uh, network that we talked about previously uh, as one of my favorite examples. Uh, here, the force directed layout color codes the football teams by their conferences, again, showing a strong separation between them so that we expected community detection to run pretty well on this example. And as we saw previously, it does. It just does better at a non-default resolution parameter. 
And here on the left, we plot what happens when we, uh, when we really overkill this problem by calling the Louvain algorithm at 50,000 randomly selected gamma values. You don't need to call it 50,000 times. I'm just doing so for, uh, for the sake of presenting the workflow. And um, this actually runs remarkably fast um, because of the speed of the Louvain algorithm. And we're gonna plot the Q value at that uh, gamma as a red dot. And you can see in particular that there are many cases here that are not quite optimal. And we plot the number of communities identified at that gamma value here in orange. And so you see that that, um, that, that long plateau that we saw when we called Leiden before, Leiden doing um, some work to clean up the Louvain, uh, doing, doing more iterations to, as an improvement on Louvain, we saw um, that it looked a little cleaner, but that it had the same general shape of a rise in the number of communities as we increased gamma past the default value, and then a long plateau at 12 communities before it rose again. The idea here is that we're trying to give the data an opportunity to tell us the resolution scale at which meaningful communities can be found. Um, and very importantly, um, again, I wanna stress that the plateau here is definitely at gamma values larger than the default gamma equals one value. Um, again, 50,000 Louvain calls here is, is total overkill for the purpose of this demonstration. We don't need this many. And in fact, um, even though we called Louvain 50,000 times at randomly selected gamma values, we only got back out 384 different partitions of nodes into communities here. Um, nevertheless, how to make sense of 384 partitions is maybe a bit of a headache. So we need to stop and recognize that the quality of a given partition as a function of gamma isn't a point value at a single gamma that was input to the algorithm. Rather, just by a trivial grouping of terms, um, we can see that the sum is controlled by the indicator function. And so for a given partition that then sets the indicator function, that is it sets which uh, node pairs i, j are within the same community uh, as one another. We can then group uh, the contributions here, and there's now only just scalar contributions to the total value of q from the adjacency matrix as one sum to give a hat, and from the null model p, whether you're using constant pots model or you're using uh, the newman gervan uh, model for undirected networks, or you're using uh, some other null model appropriate uh, to say bipartite or signed uh, graphs, et cetera, um, that just contributes uh, a, a scalar p hat, which is set again by the selected partition sigma. And so now this um, defines a line in the space of q and gamma. So that is each of these 384 partitions isn't just a point in the plane here, it defines a different line. And so maximizing Q at any gamma value corresponds to finding which of these lines is the upper envelope of the curve at that point. And so um, this basically is a half space intersection problem. You find the line segments that comprise the upper envelope of Q versus gamma. And in this example, we find that only 19 of these 384 partitions are admissible in the sense that their lines are anywhere on this upper envelope. Um, and moreover, by showing the intersections of these lines on the upper envelope by triangles, you can see that really it's only two of these lines um, here and here that have longer segments on the upper envelope. Most of the rest of them are just very briefly uh, optimal relative to the 384 unique partitions that we found here. With our attention focused then on only these two partitions, we find that one has 12 communities and the other has 13. And then if you go down and you query the community labels uh, more closely under the hood, of course it's me, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I would do that with a contingency table say, it turns out that this 13 community Part partition here is simply splitting one of the 12 communities into two parts. So the utility of this method becomes even more apparent on larger, more complex examples. Um, so these are just the diagrams that you get if you do this on the human protein reactome network. Um, basically the point is to take something that is very noisy, uh, identifies uh, even in this case here with 20,000 different calls to the Louvain algorithm, 
almost every one of them gave a different partition. 19,980 of the partitions um, are unique here, but only 39 of those have their corresponding Q versus gamma line anywhere on the upper envelope here. And so if we look in again, we're gonna use the triangles to be the intersections between those lines, you can then see that there's a few spots where the line segment is longer and then many places where there are many of these partitions cross over from each other quickly. Um, here we use this pairwise adjusted mutual information diagram to help us identify, uh, graphically identify further some of the regions. This is a partition and how similar it is to other admissible partitions that have domains of optimality nearby in uh, the, the, in this case, the one-dimensional gamma parameter space. And um, though we're not going to go into it in any, any detail here, everything we've just sketched out for Q versus gamma lines extends to multi-layer networks with Q versus two parameters, gamma and omega, defining a plane where I and J now index all of the separate node layers. And we're using a simple notation here to highlight that the linear relationship between Q uh, the data in A, the intralayer null model in P, and the intralayer, uh, the interlayer coupling C um, still exists. So we just have that Q is a linear function now of A hat, P hat, and C hat uh, defined by the partition. And all um, the multilayer examples that we're going to talk about today are with the same resolution parameter gamma. Uh, within each layer and with a uniform interlayer coupling omega. But if one knew from other results that gamma and omega should vary in a specific way, you could absorb that variation directly into the definitions of P and C here and still have uh, a 2D parameter space. Or if you like, there's now two knobs on our microscope that we're going to turn, that we're going to uh, tune to try to see um, structures resolved at different scales uh, within the layers and across the layers. Uh, and so now as an example, we go back to that uh, Senate roll call similarity multilayer example that we talked about um, with senators across the first 110 Congresses. Um, in uh, this dia these diagrams are the result of calling Jen Louvain um, 240,000 times within the uh, range of gamma and omega parameters shown here. Uh, again, uh, the vast majority of these give unique partitions. We have nearly 198,000 unique partitions, but only 1447 of them are admissible in the sense of being anywhere optimal relative to these nearly 200,000 unique partitions. And again, as we've uh, seen before, only some of these have uh, sizable domains of optimality in what is now a 2D resolution space. Um, the diagrams on the left, we color the domains of optimality by an average adjusted mutual information of a partition with its neighbors in the parameter space. And this helps draw our eye to focus on uh, those partitions with high average AMI and larger areas in this plane. So, so regions near the default gamma equals one, maybe a little below the, the gamma equals one uh, resolution value and coupling values a little below one um, here look like that. Uh, that's what at least this diagram draws my eye to. On the right, we color code each domain by its agreement with the nominal party labels of each senator. Uh, this shows very high agreement in, uh, in that same region and really extending uh, in a, if you like, a, a tongue of, of larger, a larger range of omega here, uh, showing very high agreement with the nominal party labels now, admittedly, interpreting a diagram like this is, is something of an art. And uh, how might we make this more quantitative or, or more prescriptive? That's what, we're, what we what really want to do here with this, uh, with this lecture here. So the, the second of the three parts in the second lecture here, uh, we're going to take a quick detour to talk about a, a fascinating equivalence that Mark Newman first identified between the modularity perspective and inference of stochastic block models. And Newman showed that if you, if you look, uh, if you took the log likelihood of a degree corrected planted partition of K blocks, 
Uh, so here with a pair of theta parameters for in block and out of block edges. And if you rewrote this log likelihood the right way, you get a formula that looks an awful lot like modularity, but with a gamma. So here's, this is, uh, this is now just a multiplicative factor. So this is like our gamma um, that self-consistently matches the theta values empirically estimated from that uh, same partition. So, so the idea here is, is that if you evaluate the theta in and the theta out for a given partition that you've obtained, you can then compute the gamma and ask whether or not that's the gamma uh, or how close is that gamma to the gamma that you use to actually identify the partition in the first place. Um, and Newman uh, basically proposes an iterative procedure to, to, uh, to self-consistently reach a partition that has the theta ins and the theta outs um, that, that, that tell you what gamma that partition should be at. And so do you then find whether or not the partition you found at that gamma corresponds to a partition that actually um, has that gamma? An important wrinkle here that's uh, important to this uh, part of the talk is that Newman proposed that the statistically principled way to do this would be to hold the number of communities, in this case, K, the number of blocks, to be fixed, consistent with the norms of stochastic block modeling, and assume that K was provided a priori or that it might be obtained in some other way. And in this table here of results, um, of most interest for, for our narrative that we've had so far today and for where we're going to take this for the rest of the lecture, of course, is the result for the, uh, for the karate club. Um, the the uh, specified problem of the karate club uh, at the beginning being the split into two groups, Newman uh, focuses on the K equals two result for the karate club and finds uh, through his iterative procedure that it yields a gamma of 0.78. Um, uh, and uh, the, the two block uh, community detection uh, that uh, he obtains if he restricts to two blocks at, point, at 0.78, um, then self-consistently um, in the space of K equals two results um, terminates, uh, is self-consistent uh, for the iterative procedure here. Um, now, uh, an extension of this for multi-layer networks was done by Roxana Pamphil, um, working, uh, she's a student working with Mason Porter and uh, with others uh, in a really beautiful extension of this idea to a variety of multi-layer networks, found that if you consider different ways one might copy community labels between layers according here to a parameter P, um, then you could obtain the corresponding values for the omega parameter, the interlayer coupling in these different multilayer settings. Now, in multilayer modularity and multilayer community detection more generally, um, it's, it's, it's far less likely that we know a priori how many blocks, how many communities we want to break up into. So they proposed an iterative procedure where they find a partition and self-consistent gamma and omega values. So that is they empirically estimate these theta and P values that then give gamma and omega. Um, and they iterate then uh, to, with the empirically estimated theta and P values computing gamma and omega um, repeat to find communities at those values of gamma and omega, but they do so without fixing the number of blocks K uh, ahead of time. And um, we're gonna see that this key difference here, while, it, um, while it's very powerful, because again, in multilayer modularity, you very infrequently know how many communities you would wanna split into ahead of time. Um, we're gonna see that that, uh, that that complicates things a little bit and, and causes us a, 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 creates a problem for us that we want to solve. And it needs to be pointed out, I think, that um, they make, a, I think, a reasonable argument in this paper that even though it might not be um, on the same statistically principled ground for general stochastic block models uh, to leave the number of communities fixed, since um, what's being used here is really only degree corrected planted partition models, changing the numbers of blocks here does not change the number of parameters in the system. And so letting K 
uh, vary here um, should be statistically okay in the, in the space of planted partition models. Um, I also wanna say um, that we're only here gonna look at uniform coupling with constant gamma across the layers, but that again, as I mentioned uh, previously, if you knew uh, from other calculations, like um, they, they do some really amazing things with some other models where they let the resolution parameters and the coupling parameters vary um, across or between layers, um, that, that there's more complicated things you can look at here. Um, so I highly recommend um, both of these papers. Uh, I think they're like, they're truly awesome. And, um, and I recommend them, but I think the iterative procedure with K varying, uh, as in the way that Pam Phil et al. Uh, recommend, it's, it's important to know that that procedure can be pretty fussy. And, and in particular, we can see that it's fussy even on our simplest example of Zachary's Karate Club. So now again, in Newman's version of the procedure, we fix that K equals two. And, uh, as soon as you fix and you uh, the k equals two and you only generate networks that have uh, two communities. Um, so so here this is a restricted uh, modularity optimization procedure where even at very large gamma, uh, say you know gamma's um, well above the region where the two community solution beats. Uh, uh, is it, or I should say up here at large, uh, large values of gamma, larger numbers of communities would yield larger quality values. But if you restrict yourself to only look at the solutions that have two communities, then what happens is virtually every solution you find, regardless of what value you put uh, in for gamma, um, immediately gives you empirical estimates for the thetas that yield in Newman's formula that the gamma is gonna be 0.78. And then you find the two community partition that's found there at 0.78. Uh, again, if you're restricting uh, to only K equals two solutions. But under Pamphil et al's proposed iterations where we allow K to vary, we see that there's much less consistency in the outcomes. And um, now if you start at very small gammas in particular, I think it's, it's really instructive to, to see that if you start at very small gammas, then, um, then typically you, you find uh, solutions with two communities and it immediately jumps to a gamma near 0.78. However, oops, excuse me. Um, however, then um, at 0.78, there's actually a three community partition that has a higher value of Q there than the two community partition does. And if the heuristic happens to find that, again, the heuristic not guaranteeing to always find the global optimum, if the heuristic finds the three community solution, then it jumps up to a value that's near 0.9. And again, sometimes it stops there, but it turns out that there's a four community solution at, point, at a gamma of 0.9 that beats the three community solution. So if the heuristic finds the four community solution, then it jumps again and it jumps over into this region slightly above one. Recall that at the value one, we had a four community solution. And depending on exactly um, uh, the randomness of the procedure, it ends up at one of two possible four community solutions there that are uh, effectively very similar to each other. Uh, similarly, if you, if you start at uh, high values of gamma, you very quickly uh, work down to lower values of gamma and you most commonly stop at one of those uh, four community solutions there, very slightly above gamma of one. Uh, all the blue, each of the blue dots here represents the final solution of one of these iterative procedures. And so you can see that it's much more sensitive to the randomness of single calls of the Louvain algorithm here, if you let K vary. And our goal for the rest of the talk is really to, to, to clamp down on this randomness so that we have a method that gives uh, more consistent results and is more useful uh, to, to, um, to the user in, in different applications. Now that was of course the simplest case and things get much more complicated, uh, particularly if you go to the multi-layer case. 
Uh, Pamphil et al. really nicely studied this in detail in their paper by considering, considering a synthetic multilayer example defined as two blocks with an inner layer copying, copying probability and different in and out community connect, connection probabilities. So this is one of the figures from their paper, um, which they denote as being an easy case. So the, uh, an easy regime where they're the, setting the values of the copying probability um, and uh, the uh, eta and the ratio of out um, to in uh, connection probabilities uh, epsilon here. And so at the, in this easy regime, uh, the arrows indicate the direction of the step of the map after averaging parameter estimates obtained from multiple calls. So in this case, I think there was 10 calls at each of these points um, at that parameter point, and then uh, move and then take the step to the average of the gamma omega point that um, that those 10 calls uh, pointed you to. And you can see here that most things point either directly at or eventually would uh, would go around, loop around, and uh, flow down to the blue dot. The blue dot here happens to correspond to the correct parameter estimates that one obtains from the input ground truth planted partition in this synthetic example. So this is their easy regime because you can see that as long as you start at values of gamma that are small enough, um, there is a, a regime up here at the top where gamma seems to, uh, large enough values of gamma, everything seems to flow away. But as long as you start at values of gamma small enough, eventually everything is gonna step around and point towards this blue dot. However, they also demonstrate a hard regime. And in the hard regime, uh, with a smaller copying probability and a higher rate of out community edges, uh, everything eventually diverges away to larger values of gamma. Um, even at the blue point here, you can see that partitions found at these values of, uh, by the algorithm at values of gamma and omega near the blue point step away from the blue point and then eventually flow away uh, or step away, I should say, towards much larger values of gamma. Um, Pamphil et al. have a, a, a really nice way to ameliorate this problem by proposing additional heuristics that are triggered when the iterations are diverging and backtrack along the map steps. And while their backtracking works on this example, um, on this particular example of theirs, they openly acknowledge that it's, it's relatively ad hoc that this works out. And the problem is that because of the, the pseudo-random stochastic variability in the community detection algorithm, uh, it's because it's a heuristic algorithm here, even calculations near the blue point here almost never return partitions that are similar enough to the planted partition to actually stay near that point. Now, if you did find that, um, if you did put in the planted partition at the blue point, you would find that it should stay there. And the, and the planted partition is uh, does in indeed appear to be the optimal at that point. But the pseudo-random nature of the community detection heuristics almost never find uh, a partition that's close enough to that optimum value at that point. And instead, they find these other values that then push it away to somewhere else. So now in the last part of the talk, can we fix this? Well, obviously I wouldn't have set this up unless there was a way to fix it. And the solution I'm going to propose to you is to combine the ideas from these past two sections of the talk. So rather than iterating this map on points in the parameter space and continually rerunning the community detection at the individual points, we're instead going to iterate the map directly on the champ set, meaning that we're iterating a map on only a finite set of states corresponding to the small number of admissible partitions that are identified that are somewhere optimal in the parameter space. And by definition, there's no such thing as an unstable fixed point on a finite state map. A, po a, a point is either a fixed point or it's not. Now, this work was led by Ryan Gibson, who was an undergraduate at, at Chapel Hill and then stayed on uh, to do his computer science master's degree in, the, in our four plus one program. Um, 
this is uh, this is the work that the the code the Python code for implementing this is already available. Um, and Ryan and I are working uh, on a manuscript um, that is in preparation and will hopefully be finished soon. Um, again, like with Champ, we start with some set of partitions, however they were identified. So the, the far left uh, piece of the cartoon here, you generate a bunch of partitions. They might be associated with uh, values obtained by an algorithm or by a single algorithm or multiple different algorithms um, at different points in the parameter space. Um, however, those partitions were identified, we can then carve up the parameter space using CHAMP by identifying the admissible partitions and the domain of optimality for each admissible partition. So in the picture here, uh, a single partition is dominant in the pink region here, uh, a single partition is dominant in the brown region here, a different partition is dominant in this brown region here, the colors um, uh, it's sort of a, a, a color mapping problem. Um, the, the, the brown does not indicate the same partition in these two points. Every partition has a convex domain of optimality. And so each of these different polygons represents one of the partitions and it, it encodes the, the, uh, the piece of the parameter space where that partition is optimal relative to all of the partitions that were input into CHAMP. Then if we use these uh, mapping ideas from Newman's equivalence with stochastic block model inference and the extensions due to Pamphil et al, we aren't mapping points in the parameter space uh, to other points. We map each uh, polygon is a single partition. So every, uh, that partition maps to a point in the parameter space. And then we can see what, uh, what partition is optimal at that point by seeing which polygon is it in. So really now it's just a map from polygons to polygons. And in the cartoon, uh, in the diagram here, what you can see is that uh, you might step from the green, uh, from the green polygon here to the yellow polygon and then into the blue polygon. Or if you start in the purple polygon over here, you go to the green, the yellow, and then the blue everything eventually steps either into the pink polygon, which maps to itself, or the blue polygon that maps to itself. And so this method of pruning out the partitions of that were already in the champ set um, in this cartoon only find these two fixed points. Um, I should also just say that, um, you know, what the way that we're laying it out here as, as a linear workflow is just a framework. It's not a strict recipe. You could use these ideas in different combinations. You could, um, you could combine them together. You could step and generate additional, uh, additional partitions and update your champ solutions along the way. Um, but the, but the general picture of the framework, um, is going to stay the same. Now to demonstrate this, we're going to go back to the Zachary Karate Club again. And we're gonna just unbelievably overkill this um, by just to just to be certain that that we're showing you um, the 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 complete set of what could happen here. Uh, Ryan ran the Louvain algorithm ten million times on a uniformly spaced grid here of gamma running from zero to two. Now that sounds absolutely crazy, right? But it took him less than five minutes on his eight core desktop computer. And granted, you know, he's a computer science major and then master's student. So it's a really nice desktop computer. But still, this entire calculation took five minutes. Uh, the diagram here is effectively the same if you only call Louvain 100 times, not 10 million times. Um, and of course, 100 times is going to be almost instantaneous on anybody's computer. What we're plotting here is the number of communities and the corresponding interval for each partition in the champ set. So there's a single two community, I mean, a, a one community solution, that's the, you know, that's the, the, uh, the boring, you just have the connected component is optimal up until a gamma near 0.25. Then there's a single two community solution that is optimal up uh, for some range of gamma, followed by a three community solution. And then there are multiple four community solutions um, in here in this plateau, uh, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from each of these 
um, from the midpoint of each of these regions here. So for instance, here from the midpoint, what we're showing is an arrow from that midpoint of that interval corresponding to the gamma estimate that is uh, that is obtained for the partition that was optimal here. And so you can see that this, um, you can see that this, uh, this two community partition jumps up to a gamma estimate near again of 0.78 as we saw before, but that the three this three community solution is actually optimal there, jumps up to a four community solution, and then eventually settles down to a fixed point here uh, for a gamma that's slightly bigger than one, but is in fact the same, um, the same partition that you, that you find as the optimum partition at gamma equal to one. Um, and now, so this is if we allow K to vary, you can see that everything flows into this purple interval with four communities. Um, importantly, if you knew going in that you wanted to fix K, and you know, again, like in Newman's example, K equals two, um, then that would simply change the set of partitions that you're allowed to look at here. You wouldn't be including these three, four, five, six community partitions in the champ set at all anyway. You would only uh, include uh, two community partitions input it into CHAMP, and then, can't, uh, then CHAMP would only use those two community partitions to identify which partition uh, from the set of two community partitions is optimal at each point in, in gamma, and everything would continue to work well under that fixed uh, value of K. Um, now returning to the two synthetic multilayer regimes that Panfil et al. highlighted, start with the easy regime, of course. Here on the left is a reproduction of their map for the easy regime case, uh, again, showing that everything below a threshold gamma appears to iterate eventually towards the blue dot of the ground truth planet partition. Uh, and on the right, you can see that the corresponding finite state map on the champ set, in most cases here, almost immediately jumps to the green domain. And that green domain is a fixed point of this a uh, finite state map. It, it has uh, two communities and it has a, an adjusted mutual information around 0.95 with the planted partition. That is, that corresponds to 99.5% of the node layers were placed correctly here. They're placed the same as the planted partition. Um, it, it is of note that at higher values of gamma here in this diagram, there, there are other fixed points. There's um, there's five other fixed points with higher values of gamma um, that have 12 communities, 13 communities, 16 communities, 21 and 28. But, um, but obviously the, the one that, that uh, is taking up a large region, has a large domain of optimality here, a large polygon um, is the green one. And you can see that everything at a small enough gamma uh, jumps uh, almost immediately to that green polygon. Um, the, the real value of pushing all of this to a map, not in the continuous plane, but on this finite state, um, uh, on, this, on this finite state of the admissible partitions map, um, is that if we move to the hard case, so again, we decrease the copying probability, and uh, we decrease the strength of the planted partition in the sense that we increase the, the ratio of edges that cross communities. Uh, the benefit of using CHAMP to define this finite state map becomes, becomes even clearer. So on the left, again, uh, is working in the continuous parameter space, a la Pamphil et al. Uh, and again, stochastic fluctuations from running the computational heuristic, even at the, the correct point in the space, push the estimate away from what should be a fixed point at the blue dot. And it runs away then to larger gamma with, more, with a larger number of communities. But if instead you run the finite state map on the champ set, everything below this uh, threshold gamma very quickly maps onto this very large orange domain with two communities that is again in very high agreement with the planted partition. The reason this case is hard in, uh, is that around an omega of 0.8, um, uh, gamma is uh, around that blue point. So that's uh, a point of uh, uh, gamma's 0.8, uh, I'm sorry, omega's 0.8, gamma around 0.96. Around that point there, the blue point, the heuristic returns partitions with, with 
Q values that are only around 90% of the ground truth. It's, it's just a remarkable, uh, the, the, it's a, a remarkable situation, um, of course, that happens anytime you're running a computational heuristic that you, you don't have guarantees that you've found the global optimum. And, and at that particular point, just something about the ground truth partition is, is often a spot that is harder for this generalized Louvain algorithm to access it. But again, when we're, when we're working on a finite state map on the champ set, we don't have to run we don't have to rerun the community detection algorithm at the blue point. We gather together all of the different values at which we ran community detection, and then we uh, process them through CHAMP, and CHAMP picks out for us this very large orange domain. And so then when we map from uh, each of the partitions in the admissible set, you can see that a, la a large number of them map into this orange domain, and the orange domain maps to itself, um, and it maps to itself to a value that is near the blue point. Um, importantly, even if we do these calculations with, because again, I've sort of said repeatedly, we've been sort of overkilling these by running them at, at very large numbers of, uh, of uh, calls to the generalized Levain function here. If you run it with much smaller input sets to champ, you still find appropriate parameter values. Uh, here on the left, we're only doing 1,200 runs, which is comparable to the number of runs it took to do the, the Pample et al. diagram. Uh, it still finds a fixed point near the correct values, even though it's a slightly different partition with a slightly smaller mutual information, um, even if you run it only 50 times. Um, so now you're on a very coarse grid. Um, you identify here this gray domain, um, which, uh, which everything maps to, and it is very close to the planted partition. So the, uh, the work here in the last part of the talk um, is, is, is in a manuscript that it, that's actively in, in preparation and should be done, um, I, I hope soon, but there is Python code. And the Python code's on GitHub and you can pip install it. Um, so go to uh, Ryan Gibson's modularity pruning page here. Um, and, uh, and we'd be happy to help you with any issues that you might run into using it. We'd be excited to see it used uh, for different applications. Um, if, if like many of you in the target audience of this, of this workshop aren't using Python, um, you know, I hope that we will be able to bring this to R in the, in the not too distant future. So with that, I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this material today. Um, I, I uh, look forward to our conversation and, and the, um, in the uh, live part of this virtual workshop. And uh, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to take those questions there or feel free to contact me uh, separately from that. I'd be happy to uh, do what we can to help you use these tools uh, in your own work. Thank you again.